Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, for those very nice words. Uh, and I, I, I would like to thank especially the Calia Prize Selection Committee for, uh, for deeming you worthy of this honor. So I really appreciate you all coming. I appreciate also the speakers who agreed to come to uh, share their expertise with us. I'm sure they're going to enhance the quality of the conference a great deal. So, so I really appreciate it. And thank you, Mark, for that uh, wonderful picture. <laughs> yeah, there's a part of me that wishes I still look that way. <laughs> uh, so, but thank you. I, I, I'm truly honored and, and, and humbled to, to be here. So this is a, this is a wonderful thing. Um, I've uh, planned my talk in such a way that we plenty of time for questions at the end. <clears throat> but. Um, Given, the, given the, the circumstances, please understand you need to do your part. You need to make your questions very easy. Because <laughs> if you make me look bad, then, then the Collier Center Selection Committee will <laughs> be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll feel very awkward by asking me to give the prize back. <laughs> you might even say what it should cost, but you know, other than that, it's probably a bad deal. So. You know, I'll, I'll uh, do my best to live up to the very high standards of the Collier Prize. Uh, Okay, uh, well, we've heard a lot about specific language in our reading panel discussion, but this is what I'll be talking about today, children with specific language in um, And um, uh, let me go ahead and get started by simply acknowledging the many people who I've collaborated with uh, on the studies that I'll be touching on today. Some of them are here, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the National Institutes of for exploring much of the research that I'll be talking about today. Okay, and so this is going to be a bit of a review, just because so many of you now, you knew about specific language impairment then, or you certainly do now. But just to get us all calibrated, we are talking about a group of kids who have a significant deficit in language ability, and yet they show normal hearing, they earn age-appropriate scores on nonverbal testing intelligence, and they do not show any evidence of, of frank neurological damage or disease. Uh, nevertheless, it's quite a heterogeneous population. There are really a lot of differences among the kids with this diagnosis. Uh, there have been studies in molecular genetics um, so far. There seems to be a pretty clear genetic component, but on the other hand, it seems to be multifactorial disorder, meaning that there's no single, no gene with a single variant or mutation that will be sufficient to cause the symptoms of SLI as we usually describe them. Likely, there are a combination of genes, each contributing a small amount of variants, possibly a combination of environmental variables as well. <clears throat> Twin studies uh, have identified thus far, stay tuned, but two heritable but seemingly um, separable types of deficits. One that broadly is defined as a weakness in formal actual memory seen when we ask children to repeat nonsense words of varying lengths. And the other broadly called problem of grammatical computation, which means things like having difficulty with grammatical morphemes that mark tense and more on that soon, uh, uh, as well as difficulties comprehending complex syntax, for instance. Um, <clears throat> but within each of the language languages that have been studied, there are some common profiles despite the heterogeneity. Uh, within uh, English, there's often a mild to moderate problem in a range of language areas like phonology and vocabulary, but a more serious deficit in morphosyntax. And uh, within the area of morphosyntax, often we find weaknesses in tense and agreement morphology. This is true not only for English, but for a variety of Germanic languages, uh, Swedish, German, two, being two of them, but also Dutch, Danish, um, uh, and, and others. Okay. When we talk about tense and agreement weaknesses, we are, for the most part, talking about a tense and agreement inconsistency, a protracted period of these kids being inconsistent. So the same child, possibly in the same language sample on the same day, might say both dad sings every day and dad sing every day. You might say mom played soccer yesterday as well as mom played soccer yesterday. You might say Ernie's running as well as Ernie running. Very often when we talk about special problems with tense and agreement, um, uh, morphology, we are often alluding to some findings that might have emerged from a three-group design. Um, so along with having children with specific language impairment, I'll often use the term SLI, very often I'm seeing kids right around age five, so this would be a typical age group, 
Well, but those get to be very often will have same age peers. So TDA in the middle stands for typically developing children match for age. But oftentimes in this particular uh, paradigm, we'll use a third group, younger group of typically developing children. In this instance, a match on a language measure that relates to production, mean length of utterance, or average sentence length. And you can see when we match children with SLI with, with uh, kids, uh, typical kids in the same NLU, that the typical kids will be younger close to two years of age when we're dealing with five-year-old children with SLI, that's often when it comes out. And when you do this, sorry that there's a little bit of flaw in this particular figure, but when you do this, you'll find out that the children with SLI, green in bars in this particular case, not only have less proficiency than their same age peers, the kids in the white bars, but also less proficiency than these younger kids, even though these younger kids uh, you have the same MLU. Okay? So that's a very common kind of pattern. Now, when we talk about dealing with this tense and grievous inconsistency problem, any kind of satisfactory account really has to deal with, must address several factors. One is the one we just touched on, is inconsistent use, and people say general play or general plays at the same moment. Um, but also that when kids do produce a tense and agreement morpheme, it's usually in, the, in an appropriate, in an appropriate context. So you don't get things like lead plays very often. So it's not haphazard when they do use these forms. Uh, also, it doesn't seem to be rote because we find overextensions, examples of creative errors in their speech. They might say throw instead of through, something they would not have picked up from the input. So there's some element of creativity. So when they do make use of correct forms, we usually think that they are, uh, they know when to use the forms if they are going to use them. And then it'll be an important theme in, in what I talk about today. When children fail to use these <coughs> tests and agreement forms, it appears as if they are using instead a non-finite form, which is often an infinitive kind of form, um, rather than um, trying to say uh, a grammatical morpheme, it just doesn't come out right. So along the top, we could see the dilemma. For the longest time, we were debating as to what is the nature of this error. So if a child should have said in the context, the girl played, but it came out the girl play, well, is it the child choosing an infinitive, because infinitives are bare stems in English? Um, or does the is the child trying to say played and locks it up and um, the ED doesn't come out right? Well, when we look at Germanic languages like Swedish, um, it seems that it's an infinitive that's used instead of a finite form. If you look at um, in the leka, the, the A in, in white, the inflection, the inflection A, that's an infinitive inflection, uh, like to play. It's an older infinitive inflection. So when these children mean to say the girl played in Swedish, but it comes out the girl play, they're actually producing an alternative form that has an over an infinitive. In this language, by the way, uh, you can say a bear stem, lake, L-E-K, without the ending in it. It's like an imperative, like play, like go out and play. So it's not that they don't hear bear stems. Okay. Okay, so here's the, the, the main um, part of the, the talk. <coughs> could this alternation between correct tense and agreement forms and non-finite forms, could that alternation have a source in the input? Well, we had hints in the literature for some time. Certainly some of our own studies and SLI, some of my studies in syntactic priming, an intervention study that uh, Mark Faye um, did. Uh, we certainly see some studies in the, in, uh, the typical child literature dealing with young, typically developing children, and there's some computational modeling studies as well, all point to the feasibility of the idea that, well, you know, some of these errors that these kids can produce that could be a source of the input. So that's what we're going to be looking at now. So, we, first of all, I do want to point out that this idea has been around for a while, that there could be something in the input that these kids are misinterpreting that's leading these kinds of errors. But I'm going to walk you through our particular take on, on this issue, okay? So here we have some pretty typical utterances by kids that are lacking in <coughs> the morphemes. Things like she, ready, little girl, happy, he, ice cream, and so on. But when we really look at things that adults say to kids, we find out that these Sequences, we'll call things like she running, um, non-finite subject verb sequences, that these non-finite subject verb sequences are very often contained in larger, perfectly grammatical utterances that these kids hear in the input. So they hear things like, is she running, is little girl happy, did he eat ice cream, and so on. So you can see where I'm going here. What we're saying is that some of these errors might derive from these kids inappropriately extracting 
in this case, the portions in brackets. And using them as standalone utterances, and possibly using them as a basis for generating new utterances. So I'll continue on with this argument here. Now here's some more exotic looking utterances, but uh, these two, like we do the dishes in running, but you've heard these. Uh, these two could be pieces, non-finite subject verb sequences and larger structures, like we do the dishes. Um, I'm sorry, will you watch me do the dishes? <laughs> Some of like the kids I studied. After a couple things like her running, so her to find her. <laughs> will you watch me do the dishes? Uh, I saw you running, let's watch the frog hop, and so on. So, same, the same general idea that, that holds. Now, to continue on with our thinking, what I'm going to do is show you different examples. I'm going to pick a common syntactic structure, the one that I just circled here. Uh, I saw him running, the same thing as I saw the boy running. Is that structure, just so you can see that our line of thinking, we're going to stay with that one structure and kind of walk you through it. But please bear in mind that I could have chosen a variety of these constructions to do the same thing. Okay? So what we're saying basically is that, okay, so, Typical things like the dog's eating, perfectly grammatical utterance could certainly have a source in the input. The kid could hear things like, look, the dog's eating. But we're also saying that a form like the dog eating that lacks tense and agreement forms could well have come from something like, I see the dog eating, or is the dog eating, for that matter. So what we're basically saying is early on, young, typically developing children for a brief period of time, and children with SLI for a protracted period of time, might be extracting sequences that are perfectly meaningful subject verb propositions, like the dog eating, from these larger structures because they don't understand what we're calling them, in this case, the finiteness dependencies, the dependencies that the dog eating really isn't a standalone utterance, it depends on something that's appearing prior to that structure. Okay. Now, that means that for a very brief period of time in typical development and for a more extended period of time in children with SLI, there are two sources of generating utterances that have this basic kind of meaning. One compatible with the adult grammar, like the dog's eating, and one incompatible, like the dog eating. Now, in typical development, these kids uh, soon figure out the, the, the structure and realize that the dog eating is really dependent on a larger form. I see the dog eating, and as a consequence, um, they understand the larger structure, and the dog eating, the form that is incompatible with the adult grammar, is no longer serving as a source for generating new utterances. So when they start generating new utterances, like the cat's eating and the bird's eating, it's really coming from a source that's compatible with the adult grammar. Not so for children with SLI, we propose, that they're stuck for a longer period of time and not understanding that larger structure. So when they're generating, continue to generate novel utterances, they're not only generating things like the cat's eating and the bird's eating, the dog was eating from the dog's eating, but they're also generating things like the cat eating, the bird eating on their own based on a, a source that's really incompatible with the adult grammar because they really haven't understood the larger structure yet. That's the basic idea that we're going to go with. Okay, so, to evaluate this idea, we've been pursuing four different methods. Okay, um, and um, just to introduce, just give, to give you the preview, then I'll be providing data relative to each of these methods. One, we're going to be talking about a novel verb learning paradigm that we can use. Then we're going to talk about some sentence comprehension studies and more traditional picture pointing kinds of tasks. Uh, and then we'll be talking about some looking while listening data. This is basically eye gaze data to try to explore some issues. And then in a more speculative note, I'll be talking about some electrophysiological evidence as well. Uh, okay, so first novel verb learning. <clears throat> what we're asking here is, will children with SLI produce novel verbs, nonsense verbs, if you will, in non-finite form or with tense agreement depending on how these verbs appear in the inputs. So, uh, this is the first study that I did with my, uh, my colleague, uh, Pat Deavy. So, again, we have our five-year-old kids with SLI. These kids are inconsistent in using auxiliary is. That will be our focus for this particular study. We're using the auxiliary is in 54% of obligatory context. Pretty inconsistent, pretty typical of these kids at that age. Uh, this is our first crack at this particular paradigm, so we had age controls. Um, and these kids, of course, were much more proficient in auxiliary as five-year-olds usually are. So they're on 95% use. So therefore, we're expecting that these age controls, because they're so good with auxiliary is, are not going to be 
as influenced by the, the particular context, the sentence context that they hear things in. They can be less swayed by input compared to the children of SLI, given their greater proficiency already. So we have, in this particular study, each kid heard five novel verbs presented in a, a non-finite form. So we saw the dog padding. What I mean by non-finite form is that sequence, the dog padding, is this non-finite subject verb proposition. Um, they heard five verbs exclusively in a non-finite form like that, and five other novel verbs exclusively with an auxiliary like just now the verb was chanting. Okay. Following the presentations, the children were then tested on their use of these novel verbs. So if they heard the bird was chanting exclusively, they were also tested on the, their testimony auxiliary is, like the bird is chanting or the cat is chanting. We varied the subject so they had to create their own sentence. It wasn't just um, um, strict memorization. Or if they heard we saw the dog pagging, they were tested again on something that required, in a context that required the dog is pagging or the cow is pagging. Okay? So again, we expected the children with SLI to be more influenced by the input. And sure enough, that's what we found. The age controls in the, of the white bars, they were at high level of use of auxiliary is no matter whether they heard like we saw the dog pagging or, or the dog was chanting. On the other hand, the children with SLI were clearly influenced by how that novel word was presented. If it was presented it, like the, we saw the dog pagging, for instance, they were more likely than the <coughs> typical kids to say the cat pagging rather than the cat is pagging. You get the, the general idea here. Okay. Uh, and as such, we said, Mark Fay was heavily involved with <coughs> that's impressed. We again had kids, in this case, close to age five on average. Here we focused on third person singular S's and runs and jumps. Okay, because the same idea could apply to, to these kids as well. And our kids were quite inconsistent. They were only 32% use of things like runs and jumps in obligatory contexts. This time, we went with younger control kids, match for mean length of utterance. You can see they averaged two years, 10 months in age. Um, but as is so often the case, when you compare children with SLI with younger controls, the younger controls are still better than the kids with SLI in, in uh, tense agreement forms. And these kids are at 63%. The fact that they were not at mastery, though, at 63% tells us they led us to expect that they probably would be influenced by the input, just not to the same degree as the kids who are down at 32%. Right? All right. So uh, for these kids, in the f when they heard novel verbs in finite form, it was either the type all day long the dog rells, or do you think the dog rells? There is the dog rells in each case. That's a finite sequence, got third singular. In the non-finite form, the novel verbs they heard with either took the form, let's watch the bird pag, or does the bird pag. In this case, we've got the dog pag, that sequence, which that sequence is non-finite. And then when we tested the children, we tested them in a context that required third singular, like every day the cat rells, but also in a non-finite sequence, as we want to watch the cat rell. Now, I want to point out this last sentence, this non-finite probe from we chose it specifically because this is the very kind of thing we thought these kids would not understand very well. It's really part of our whole hypothesis that they just don't understand the dependencies involved because they, remember, these kids say things like cat runs every day. If they use the third person singular S, it's, it's correct. So when they got to the point of the cat rails could be quite logical, especially if they heard something like all day long the dog rails, okay? Uh, we thought they might actually be fooled into saying the cat rells because they can do local agreement if they don't understand that larger structure, which is our whole, our whole point. Uh, well, in fact, we did find stronger input effects in the children with SLI, but especially on these non-finite probes. And here I'll show you a graph that, that, uh, that we have. Um, this is the instance along the bottom. This is the case where the probe was the, of the type we want to watch the cat rel would be the correct response. Now, the blue line, I hope you can see it, is that's the, the children with SLI. And on the left-hand side um, is where you see the blue line really quite low. And that's the instance where the kids with SLI were hearing a verb like rel in the form of, do you think the dog rels? And then they were tested on, we want to watch the cat. And that lower score means a lot of times these kids, after hearing, do you think the dog rels? 
test, when they were tested, they said, we want to watch the cat rels. <laughs> the cat rels, right? They're just like they were going to the local agreement, okay? Um, more on that uh, towards my end of the talk because I want to follow up on that. But some of you might be thinking already, well, you know, maybe they heard rels, 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 and they thought of it as a verb like fix. That is, maybe they thought this is just a verb that ended in an S or a Z by itself without the third person singular S. Right? And if they thought it was a verb like fix, then maybe when they were saying rels, they didn't mean to be, you know, over regular, over using a third person singular. But we don't think so because we looked at it in several different ways. For one, we also had included in our probes familiar verbs. And these same kids would sometimes, not, not to the degree as the novel verbs to be sure, but oftentimes they would say things like, we want to watch the cat runs. And we know that they knew run, running, <laughs> runs. They weren't limited to, to runs. And yet in that particular context, they would go with the local agreements that the cat runs. Uh, a, a couple kids, um, when we were testing them on the probe through familiar verbs, would identify a verb like, that was supposed to be hops, they would say bounces. Okay. Um, but they would never say relses, right? Um, the schwa zitty. Uh, and then finally, I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but it turns out that only certain kinds of consonantal clusters uh, are the kind that can be in a monomorphemic word. The most famous is the KS that we see in fix, box, box, tax. But when we looked at the particular consonantal clusters involved, we shouldn't see any particular pattern at all. So we just don't think that these kids, when they use rels, if they were thinking of it as a verb like fix. Okay. All right. So, so far so good, I would like to think. Uh, <laughs> sentence comprehension is another method that we're following. This is the picture pointing kind of a task. Okay. Um, here, remember what we did so far is we're finding that these kids might be swayed by the input in some way, but our hypothesis is that these kids don't understand the larger structure, and that's why they're doing it. So here we're asking, is the inappropriate extraction and use of sentence, final, non-finite, subject, verb, sequences related to comprehension difficulty with the larger structures as we're proposing here? Um, so here's a comprehension study, again, with five-year-olds who were inconsistent in using auxiliary is right around 30%. Younger control kids, but this time the younger control kids, this is a receptive task, a comprehension study. So our, our matching measure is not going to be a production measure. It's going to be another comprehension measure. In this case, it was we matched the kids on the sentence structure subtest of the self-P2. Uh, the raw scores. <clears throat> this is a test, it's a sentence comprehension test, but it's a variety of structure, and it certainly doesn't focus very much on the ones, on the different structures we're looking at. Uh, and we were interested in, um, and you can see, of course, the kids were, were younger in this, in this match group. So what we're really interested in is the kids' comprehension of sentences like the dad sees the girl sleeping. It's also useful for things like the dad sees her sleeping, as you'll see soon. Um, but we wanted to make sure the kids understood at least the component parts, so we had control sentences like the girl was sleeping and the dad sees the girl, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this is an example of, of that item. Uh, the correct response the dad sees the girl sleeping is in the upper left. I guess you knew that. <laughs> on the upper, on the upper uh, right, we have something that we're going to be calling the principal foil, because this is a picture that also depicts a girl sleeping, right? The dad's not looking at her. Uh, I'll also mention on the lower left, this picture of the dad sees the girl, she's not sleeping, okay? And then we have a, a kind of a reverse pattern. Um, what we're predicting is that on the control sentences, like the dad sees the girl or the girl is sleeping, that the kids are going to do fine. Okay, um, these are pretty simple sentences. Um, but on the target sentences, the ones with the subordinate clause, like the dad sees the girl sleeping, we thought that children with SLI would be less stable than their, less accurate than these younger controls matching on the sentence structure subtest score. And also, not only were these kids have more difficulty, but we thought that when they made an error, that they would tend to pick the one that was called the principal foil, or one at the upper right, that they'd be swayed by the propositional value of the girl sleeping, and would kind of be oriented towards that. Okay, that's the general idea. Um, that indeed is what we found. The uh, younger control kids are pretty good on, um, on subordinate clause sentences, certainly significantly better than the children with SLI. All the kids are good on the control sentences. <coughs> okay, 
uh, the children of SLI had more difficulty with, things like the dad sees the girl sleeping. And also, when the children with SLI made errors, they showed a disproportionate tendency to go towards that principal foil. Because there are three foils, three error choices. Uh, the ones in green, that's the principal foil, the one that was in the upper right, and they were disproportionate and were going with that one. The younger typical kids not only were more accurate in general, but their errors were more evenly distributed. Okay. Uh, this is just a, a, a study that's in preparation by a postdoc in, in my lab where we cleaned up the, the foils a little bit more. Um, we always had a principal foil, we had to clean up some of the other ones a little bit better. So in a sense, this is really a replication. I'm just showing you the same error pattern. The girl sleeping, that's a principal foil over in the left, and by far the, the most frequent errors are that type. The dad sees the girl, that was the one in the lower left. You don't get that choice very often. And uh, the occasional instances, the one is called reverse, where the girl sees the dad sleeping as the picture that gets pointed to. But you can see the principal flow is by far the dominant one. Okay. Now, um, as I said, the dad sees the girl sleeping as the same structure that could generate her sleeping by virtue of the dad sees her sleeping. And that's the, the same kind of structure. So that's fine. However, these kids, at least many of them, will say things like she's sleeping, not things like her sleeping. Or sometimes they'll use both. Now, how do you get she sleeping? Well, we thought about this a lot in terms of the kind of things in the input. And the most likely uh, instances, instances of a fronted auxiliary, like is she sleeping, was she sleeping, and so on. OK, well, we want to pursue this comprehension question. But we assume that these kids hear words like is and are. Uh, and we also assume that they understand the pragmatic gist that this is a question being asked. We have to, we, they, got, they get the pragmatic. So what we're really trying to get at when we talk about comprehension here is, do the kids somehow appreciate the fact that is somehow tied to she sleeping or that are is sometimes it is in some way tied to she sleeping? And that's a little bit more subtle. You don't get at that with picture pointing tasks very easily. So we went to a looking while listening paradigm that some of you are familiar with uh, here in the audience. Um, <clears throat> This is a study that is really being um, led by uh, uh, my colleague at Purdue, Patricia Eby, who's also my lab manager, and extremely valuable to me in every respect. And she was trained at Stanford and for Knowledge Lab. She's quite proficient in this particular technique. What we're basically talking about uh, is uh, a, a, a task like this. <clears throat> Large screen TV, on the left-hand side is a picture of a boy running. The right-hand side is a picture of two dogs running. Okay. So we're, going to, we're going to be looking at the kids' eye gaze as the kids' hearing sentences and looking at these pictures. So here's a control sentence, something like, see the nice little dogs running. Now at this particular point, uh, it's not clear which sentence, which picture is being referred to until you get to dogs, right? Because it could be seeing the nice little boy running. Um, uh, in contrast, though, are the nice little dogs running? You have R as a plural cue. When you have a singular and a plural picture, R the nice it can only be one of the pictures, unless you're under that for yourself. Okay. <laughs> so the second sentence allows the listener to anticipate a picture and start moving uh, in terms of eye gaze towards the proper picture. So we're calling one of these pictures the C the nice little, that's a control picture, as one has a no finite cue, and it's plural. R, the nice little dog, has that finite cue, plural. And of course, we have the same thing for singular. See the nice little boy running, is the nice little boy running. Okay. Okay. Uh, we had uh, kids close to age five on average, four years, 10 months, um, with again younger comprehension controls, once again um, matched on sentence structure, subtest scores, raw scores. Okay. And all kids. Every kid could produce both is and are up to varying degrees. As you can see, the younger controls were very proficient. There were over 90% use of both is and are, but the children with SLI were 59%, 61%. They were inconsistent. So just looking at that, you can see what we're predicting. What we're predicting is that the younger controls, because they're already so good at both is and are, that these kids might have figured out these larger structures, because they're probably not extracting things inappropriately for their own use. Therefore, they might be making great, they might be more aware of these structural ties between the is and are and the rest of the sentence. So they're the ones who are more likely to be doing some anticipating when they hear it is or are to be gravitating more towards the target picture. Whereas the kids who are still inconsistent, 
might not have grasped that larger structure and they'd be less likely to be doing this anticipated until they get to the noun and then of course then they feel like look at the right picture. So that's the general idea. Okay. So let me walk you through this particular graph. These are the younger controls typically developed the kids mentioned on this comprehension measure. Um, uh, the middle section of this graph, if that's the, way, the time window when they've heard is or are or C, but they haven't heard the noun yet. They haven't heard dogs or boy. Okay, that part's in the far right. Okay. So when you see in the middle part of that graph a line going up, that suggests anticipatory, anticipatory looking. They're hearing R and they're starting to look towards the plural picture, for instance, even though they haven't heard the word dogs yet. Okay. Now the black circles, that's the top line, you can see very clear evidence that there, there's anticipatory looking there. Are the nice little dogs running? Okay, they're looking at before they even get to dogs. Now, the, and being compared to that of unfilled circles, I don't know if you can see that very well, that's to see the nice little dogs running. That's the control where there's no cue until you get to the noun. Uh, so there's very clear evidence that these kids are, are orienting based on R. Now, actually, they are also doing the same for is. It may be less clear, but I have to explain something. At this age group, anytime you pick a singular, singular picture versus a plural picture, kids are more likely to look at the plural picture. It just happens. You can say, blah, 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 blah. You may be looking more at the plural picture. <laughs> <laughs> so if you notice, though, that the the black triangles and the unfilled triangles, there's actually a difference there too. And if you look at the 95% confidence interval lines, you'll see there are areas where there's just no overlap. But well, what you're basically doing when you're saying, is the nice little boy running compared to see the nice little boy running, if you're banking on anticipatory looking, you're, fight, you're swimming upstream, you're fighting against the plural bias. In fact, we got the kids off that bias because the lowest line, of course, is see the nice little boy running. Singular, no cue. You know, um, and so both is and are were uh, used as, as anticipatory cues, but of course there's this heavy plural bias overlay on everything. Okay? Okay. Now here's the SLI group. No anticipatory looking that we can find at all, but there is a slight plural bias. Both of the lines along the top of the plural forms, the lower forms are both the singular forms, but it didn't really matter if you're saying, are the, are the nice little dogs running or see the nice little dogs running? They're pretty much looking the same. It didn't matter if you're saying, is the nice little boy running or see the nice little boy running? The look is pretty much the same. Notice at the far right, though, how things bounce up. That's when the noun comes. So these kids were perfectly happy to participate in the task. They were looking at the picture, but they really weren't relying on any kind of grammatical information. They were going with dogs or boy, OK? OK. <clears throat> Um, this is just a summary of what I just said, or tried to say. Uh, these kids are matched on the sentence structure set test scores, a general sentence comprehension measure. They did differ uh, ahead of time on is our production accuracy, where the younger controls were more accurate, uh, quite a bit more accurate. And sure enough, it was the younger controls who did the anticipatory looking based on the is and are uh, information, whereas the children in the really did not. Okay. So now we're getting into the speculative area. I say speculative because um, I'll be talking about some evidence from older kids. These are, not, these are kids who have been in our lab at four or five years of age. They, in fact, we got good data from them when they were youngsters. They were very inconsistent in using intensity agreements. Inconsistent. They were parts of some other earlier studies. But here I'm talking about evidence when these were nine years of age. And we could definitely find grammatical errors, but their tense and agreement problems seem to be good resolved with the way we tested them in simple sentences. If you push them into complex sentences, that's a different story. They were wonderful, but, but you know, they were not showing the kind of errors I've been showing you for these, for these four and five years. So this is a huge qualifier. So we're talking about something that I'm going to show you, I think, is pretty convincing evidence in terms of feasibility that we want to scale down to a younger age in the future. Um, this is what prompted us to look at this particular ERB study. We looked at this graph a little while ago when we talked about novel verb learning, right? When we were saying, if kids heard things like, do you think the dog rattles? These kids with SLI were tested on, we want to watch the cat, they would often say, we want to watch the cat rattles, okay? Because they didn't really understand that structure. Um, so, so in this particular study, we presented sentence. We were, we were interested in presenting sentences like "He makes the boy talk a little louder." 
which turns out is under manual glass. Well, not to me, I'm just a hair guitar. The rolling sounds good, and you can bet this sounds great. <laughs> um, uh, but we have local agreement, the part in green, the boy talks, and if these kids are really focused on, on you know, they're not understanding the structure very well, and lo locally the boy talk sounds pretty good, maybe they're not going to be too finely tuned uh, into, the, into the error. That's kind of what we're looking at. Okay, this is a study done in Chris Weber Fox's lab. She's um, an experienced ERP person in, in our department. Um, and so I rely on her expertise. Natalia Kaganovich, the last author here, is also an ERP person. She's an assistant president of Harvard. J.D. Curdy, the first author, is a postdoc who worked with me but had ERP experience before he ever came. So I'm basically the outsider here. I'm not the ERP person. I rely on their expertise. But I came up with the idea in the sentences. <laughs> so I did for something. <laughs> okay, so the basic idea is some of the sentences to these kids. Remember, these kids are nine. I'm using a cautious term of history of SLI. In fact, we could find, even then at nine, we could find individual subtests where they bond for non word repetition. Of course, they're really bad. But uh, in, on some measures, uh, in, in, if we look at just simple sentences, their tense and agreement morphology is pretty good. Okay, so I, I would want to make that clear. We match them for age, age with age controls. So some of the sentences, the ones we're most interested in, were things like he makes the boy talk a little louder. That was a grammatical version. Or he makes the boy talks a little louder. And of course, we had a huge number of, of sentences and kind of balance and so on. Um, and uh, I'll show you the results in just a minute. But these kids were asked, first of all, as they were listening in the, in the booth with the electro cap, they were asked to respond, you know, is the sentence sound OK or not? So we had behavioral judgments. Is this an OK sentence or not? And then we were also interested in, in the ERP, and especially the, the P600, which you guys out here have much more expertise than me. But, but this is a, um, a positive going waveform that uh, at least with adults, tends to occur about 600 milliseconds post onset, post, post target onset. Um, when there's, in this particular case, when there's a grammatical <coughs> error. Okay. Here are the results of the typical kids, nine year olds, for this thing like he makes the quiet boy talks a little louder. That's the part that's in red or is it pink? The black would be the grammatical versions. You can see. A whopping differences really in, in all the sites that are really relevant for the P600. These these are huge. These individuals were picking it up. They were not only the typical kids are not only accurate, but big time um, in terms of the P600. You can probably see that difference. I, you know, we put a, a, a very typical site for the P600 down the bottom. We enlarged it so you can see pretty clearly you know what's going on here. Now for the kids with the history of SLI, cautiously spoken, uh, we do get something. We had to look because originally we had a larger, we used a larger window. And we used a larger window, no differences at all. But we you know, started looking at it earlier and we made it in a late window. And when we do that, there is a difference. If you look at the bottom panel for a moment, the bottom panel, at the early window, nothing. This is the difference between grammatical and ungrammatical. In the mid window, there was something. The amplitude of the P600 was greater for the ungrammatical, the mid window for the kids with SLI. And when you get to the late window, no difference again. Okay? Uh, but even in the case in the mid window, where there was a difference between grammatical and ungrammatical, if you look straight up to the top panel, you'll see the amplitude in all cases for the typical kids is much, much larger. These are really huge. Um, so how do we interpret that? Well, first of all, the, I think we, we, the way we choose to describe that result is to say that the P600 for the, the history of SLI kids was not only reduced in the amplitude, but it was also delayed. It wasn't in the short, in the early window. And it was short-lived. It wasn't in the later window. And here's a speculative part. What we're saying is perhaps these children detected an oddity, and he makes the quiet boy talks a little louder. But their weak command of these long distance Tendencies allowed the local agreement, the boy talks, to override this initial detection of an infelicity, thus, quote, resolving the problem. Because the P600 is often described as kind of a reanalysis of the, the sentence. There's some allowance, and unlike something like anterior negativity, the P600, that there's often more of a cognitive sort of analysis going on. We think that's what might be going on. It's a little bit speculative on our part. Okay. Um, more on that later, but I hope you see some kind of common theme with, with what I'm talking about. 
Now, you might be asking, okay, but is this reduced amplitude in V600 just something about these kids uh, as opposed to this particular kind of error? Um, well, we also had sentences quite deliberately and correctly um, that had simple local agreement, like every night they talk on the phone versus every night they talk on the phone. Okay, so we also had those kind of things. And we know from the production data that kids tend not to say things like they talks. Okay? And we know from grammaticality judgment tasks, really as early as late preschool, or at least early, early elementary school, that these kids can detect errors like they talk when they're making the judgments. So we thought that uh, we would also see evidence of detection of these errors on the part of these very same kids um, with the history of SLI, even though they didn't show much evidence for these larger structures. Uh, and sure enough, on accuracy, they're pretty high. No difference between the two groups on the local agreement errors, like they talks. And the P600 results, the amplitude uh, of the P600 is just as large uh, in these kids. So, so you know, they, they, they uh, could detect these kinds of errors. Okay, so I'm going to summarize now and uh, tell you where we are. Um, uh, first, I talked about the fact we think that children with SLI are more likely to extract non-finite sequences from larger structures. That was the verb learning paradigm, the novel verb learning paradigm that we talked about. Uh, I also mentioned that these children have difficulty comprehending structures with non-finite sequences. That was the picture point that the dad sees the girl sleeping. So that's what we talked about. Um, uh, also, that these children make less use of finite information to anticipate information in subsequent non-finite sequence. That would be, are the nice little dogs running kind of eye gaze looking while we're sitting And then, just to say something about next steps. Well, I've already touched on one next step because the, the uh, ERP evidence, the P600 study, is it was done with older kids. And what we're really interested in doing is asking that very same question about kids who in the moment were inconsistent in the use of these tense of agreement morphemes. So we're now scaling it down. We're doing some pilot work now. It's looking pretty promising. But, you know, we want to be careful. We're not really ready to run the formal experiment yet. We're just doing the pilot data. But so one next step is to apply that paradigm to, to the younger age. Uh, another, uh, new, another new paradigm, or initial paradigm, is an intervention study. I know Mark is going to be providing some intervention data uh, in his talk, so stay tuned for that. But you can see the, 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 the value in presenting, controlling the input in an intervention setting in a particular way. You can test hypotheses about how the kids going to respond. Uh, and then I also have new languages. Uh, as you know, um, from the kind of introduction I've talked to, uh, I've done studies on other kinds of languages, but all the work I talked about today has been on English. We would very much like to do some novel verb learning studies on so many other languages, especially Germanic languages. Some of you have seen you did this slide before, but we're talking about it in a slightly different context now. In a language like German and Dutch, um, where the word order for a simple declarative sentence, like Christina drinks coffee, would be just that way, Christina drinks coffee. But um, we know that for a very brief period of time, young typically developing kids, and for a protracted period of time, German-speaking children with SLI will produce things, instead of Christina drinks coffee, they might say things like Christina coffee drink. And drink, in this instance, has an infinitive inflection. So it's clearly an infinitive, and it appears in final position, not in second position like it should have. Okay. But indeed, in adult German, a question that in English would be, can Christina drink coffee, would be, uh, can Christina coffee drink? That would be the, the German uh, correct uh, grammar for that. So you can see where we're going here as well. Okay. But let me mention uh, another example that we see in the German SLI literature pretty often. Um, another kind of error, instead of Christina drinks coffee, is Christina coffee drinks. Now in this case, it's drinks. It's a correct verb form, third person singular. It's actually the correct form, but it's in last final position. It should be in second position. Well, in subordinate clauses, so you have sentences like, in English, I want, let's see, I know that Christina drinks coffee. In German, that form would be, I know that Christina coffee drinks. So these, in this case, I'm stretching my hypothesis a little bit, but nevertheless, I'm still talking about dependency relationships. If these kids really don't understand these larger structures, then we could get either Christina coffee drink 
you can get your own hand Christina coffee drink, or they can get Christina coffee drinks if they know that Christina coffee drinks. Do what we're doing. So what I really like to do is to have novel verbs presented, where some of them are presented in the, much like Christina coffee. I'm sorry, much like Christina drinks coffee, in just a straight SBO word order. Other novel verbs are presented as in a can question, much like can Christina coffee drink. Still others in a subordinate clause relationship as in I know that Christina coffee drinks. And see whether we can predict. And then when we test the kids' use of these novel verbs in these different grammatical contexts, see if we can predict which errors, not only in finiteness are they going to make, are they going to produce an infinitive, are they going to produce a third person singular form, but also word order. Are they going to produce it in the correct second position, or are they going to produce it in sentence final position. So that's a flexibility we have in German and word Dutch that we just don't have any much. So we really like to test that hypothesis in terms of word So that's it for me. I'm happy to, to answer any questions. So thank you.